So our goal today, Smarter Salting in 60 Minutes, is to support um, all of you to be leaders in winter maintenance. And um, to do that, like I shared before, I'd love to hear a little bit about who's on the call right now so I can kind of tailor my comments as best as I can um, to who's who's there. So if you want to put your name, if you're able to put your name, your organization uh, in the chat and a question, goal, thought, expectation that you have for today. If the chat doesn't work for you, you can email me wiseltwise at gmail.com. But I really would love to kind of incorporate, make sure I'm hitting um, the goals and needs of, of people who are joining us live. So thanks for making the time in your day to, to be here. So the goal of winter maintenance. Um, I always ask people this, um, what's the goal? And um, comes out in a variety of ways, but the basic um, idea that I try to make sure that we emphasize is that the goal of winter maintenance um, is to keep people safe. Right. And that is our goal as we do smart salting, any salting. Right. Um, we are doing this work for public safety. And that remains that number one goal of this work. And we've seen over the years, you know, that salt is a chemical that really that helps us meet that goal. Right. Of keeping people safe. And so people have embraced really <laughs> the use of salt and um, to the point that we have gone way beyond um, what's needed to meet that goal of public safety. And um, it's almost laughable. Usually there are a few chuckles in the room when I throw up this picture, which I actually took a few blocks from my house in the Madison area. Um, and then I swept that up because it just killed me. Um, you know, it seems to happen every storm pretty similar to this. And I make a lot, make calls and I talk to people and shoot emails out. And there's just this long chain of command and we never seem to get to um, make any difference. Unfortunately, I work hard to make differences in the state and I've struggled in my own backyard, but i um, excited to be talking to all of you and sharing the word, right? So this doesn't make sense. Um, and if you were here in person, I would be asking you to share with me kind of what are the reasons why we want, we don't want to do that. And um, usually these are the responses that I hear, and I'm going to share a few visuals um, showing those. So number one is that salt is not free, right? It does cost money and the cost of salt, like most things, um, is going up. Maybe it's going up a little faster than average inflation, believe it or not. And this is, you know, data from the state DOT in Wisconsin, uh, the average cost per ton of salt. And we can see that it's about tripled in the last 20-ish years. And this is the primary driver of why the DOT is saying that we need to be better about our salt use because they are footing the bill for 400,000 plus tons of salt a year, um, sometimes 500,000 plus tons of salt a year. So they really wanna make sure that people are using that as efficiently as possible. Uh, other costs of salt are the damage that it does to our infrastructure. So the average person might not connect these things, but um, salt does a lot of damage to our soils, vegetation, um, metals, hardscaping. And um, when we look at that kind of big picture and we take all those costs together for every dollar we spend on salt, we're doing $10 of damage. So you just don't necessarily pay for that up front, right? Um, it's a hidden cost. But once we realize, kind of discover or uncover that, that cost, um, it really causes us to reflect a little bit on our use of salt and overuse. Um, in addition to all those damages, we add in, don't have really monetary values on this, but um, the cost of the damage to our water, our freshwater resources. So this is data coming out of the Madison area. Um, we can see that chloride levels, salt being sodium chloride, just steadily increasing since the city started using salt and you know, had more and more salt go down on private sidewalks and parking lots as well. Um, again, some more data from the Madison area where we have a good amount of research going on. Um, this is showing us these dots are grab samples showing that those spikes happening in the winter um, can get real high into the hundreds of milligrams per liter. Um, naturally in Wisconsin, chloride levels would be between zero and 10. The EPA has a chronic toxicity threshold of 230, but I, a lot of the newer science is um, showing us 
pretty um, significant impacts at 50, five zero milligrams per liter. So really this, this um, second bar here is artificially high. And um, what that is, if you're not familiar with milligrams per liter, like most of us aren't, um, one teaspoon of salt brings five gallons of water up to that threshold. So, so why care um, about you know, water getting a little saltier? Well, there are direct and indirect impacts to the organisms that live in the water. So we can look at the research Bill Hintz's lab is doing, University of Toledo, um, putting finger wing trout here into high road salt conditions and um, seeing that salt decreases rates of growth, reproduction, increases their susceptibility to parasites. Zooplankton are the first to be impacted at that 50, five, zero, zero milligrams per liter. As their populations go down, we see the ripple effects throughout the food web, right? It means less food going up the food chain, not as many zooplankton around to eat the algae, um, which we tend to be feeding those algae with, you know, excess nutrients. So we give them a lot of food and take away their predators. And guess what? Our lakes and streams are getting greener and murkier. So just to emphasize again, every teaspoon we can save, we're protecting five gallons of water. Um, in our drinking water uh, wells, we're also seeing those chloride and sodium concentrations climb. So again, natural in Wisconsin between zero and 10, and we are not there anymore in um, most of the state. We're seeing elevated levels, even in more rural communities. Um, if you want to dig into the science a bit more, I would highly recommend this article that came out last week in the Washington Post um, that dives into the impacts of salt on aquatic ecosystems on our drinking water. Sujay Kashal's work was highlighted there as was Bill Hintz, who I referenced earlier. And this is a pretty striking photo um, that inspired some of Sujay's work because salt as salt levels increase in our water, we actually have ion exchange happening in soils and bedrock and our pipes, um, releasing other metals, um, things like manganese that are coming out here making this drinking water orange. So um, just to set us up here, smarter salting in 60 minutes, the first kind of 10 minutes on, on the why, right? So yes, our goal of winter maintenance, number one is to keep people safe, but I turn this from a goal to goals. I'm going to add to that. In addition to keeping people safe, um, if you're a contractor, you should be wanting to run a profitable business. If you're a municipality or public agency, you want to be using your budget resources responsibly and also working to minimize harm to a hardscaping, infrastructure, water resources, Etc. So we do that by really working to use salt efficiently, the right amount of the right material at the right time. So diving in, let's think a little bit about what we have in our toolbox. So if possible, <laughs> I would like people to um, type into the chat a little bit, um, different tools that you have, maybe for tackling um, light, lighter snows, wet heavy snows, especially any tricks that you might have, um, maybe newer equipment that has helped you uh, maximize your mechanical removal. So um, just wanting to emphasize that, you know, we can talk a lot about salt. We can talk a lot about how to um, use salt efficiently, but the more material that we move, the less um, residue there is behind to salt and to remove um, with chemical means. So our goal really of winter maintenance of keeping people safe doesn't have to mean the use of chemicals, right? It's just getting us down to safe conditions. And if we can do that um, mechanically, then, then we're set. Um, but we definitely want to do it as, as well as we can mechanically. So let me toggle out here. I think you guys are seeing hopefully still the same screen. But um, I'm just uh, checking in on the chat. Looks like Daniela is here. Hi, um, thanks for joining in. I don't see any comments right now from others about um, any tools that people are using. So I'll just share with you a few pictures. Um, so this is a little collage of various um, agencies equipment. So in the top left, Danielle is from Green Bay. This is a photo I took of a um, brush tool from UW Green Bay's campus. You can see one of those similar one um, in action at Madison Area Technical College. So these tools are really great to help just sweep down to bare pavement and sometimes avoid the use of salt altogether. 
Um, we've got some big plow blades coming out, um, like this sectional blade. So the idea here is that versus a straight blade, um, a sectional blade can adapt a little bit more to um, uneven pavement surface and help still really get a good scrape. I even have a scraper, a little handheld tool here that can um, cut down through some hard pack, even chop up the ice um, versus working um, chemically to do that. So, you know, whether we're talking about bigger pieces of machinery, shovels, you know, these smaller handheld tools, like the bottom line I have here, mechanically remove as much snow as possible. Um, another um, big idea here, so kind of thinking, you know, before we even going out there, um, working to keep records, keep notes on what we're doing. Um, I don't know if I have a slide coming up here on policies, but um, working to have a written policy, I'll mention UW Green Bay again, they do have one up on their website. Um, some, a number of, I'd say municipalities do, but sometimes smaller agencies don't. And it's like, if you don't really measure and record what you do, like there's, you know, little likelihood that you're gonna be improving. So working on getting those written policies out there, they don't have to be big, they don't have to be complicated. You don't want a binder that sits on the shelf, um, but you do want something to use to kind of defend your choices. Um, and I'll kind of leave that at that and move on to my bullets here. So I wouldn't, um, like the first one says, if you don't document it, um, it's kind of like you didn't do it, right? So you're really protecting yourself um, by documenting. There are different templates available. And I'll share um, one that we've got, just super basic, but really the idea is doing whatever works for you. Um, there are technologies out there like this AccuSalt, um, I have a picture, another picture of in a moment that will actually track um, your salt for you. And then that will kind of tell you the amount that you've put down in, in a given size, like lot. So this is a picture of AccuSalt. Uh, this is Jeremy Johnson's arm, <laughs> Jeremy Johnson from the Bruce Company down in the Madison area. So they're a local contractor, maybe regional I don't know, contractor. And he's just showing um, the little attachment here that goes right onto the auger and then just kind of measures how much the auger is spinning. And that would be then um, communicating to your little um, device in the cab, um, telling so the driver can see how much they're putting down, what rates they're putting down or set that. And then that information is automatically being uploaded through the cloud um, back to people in the office too. Um, going from brand new technology, state of the art down to just like, you know, paper record keeping. Um, this is one of the forms that we put together, happy to share this out where, you know, just encourage you to make your own kind of form, whatever works for you. Next thing about smart salting is to really identify, you know, what are the sites that we're looking at? Um, <laughs> I feel like this is a commercial infomercial for Green Bay here, uh, UW Green Bay, because the photo on the bottom left again is from a training manual that, or I should say training manual, just kind of like a policy procedure manual that um, one of their staff had put together. He really worked to diagram out different routes on campus and where different machinery would go um, down to, you know, a given parking lot where the snow piles should be, because we want to make sure we'll talk about snow storage later, but, you know, we want to put those piles um, where they're not going to melt and refreeze and create a hazard, but also you don't want to just dump them into a uh, rain garden or wetland because that's where then all the trash is going to. So you want to move snow to a place where you can recover trash in the in the spring. Um, but having those maps ahead of time can really um, help support um, the use of the best practices, making sure that that communication is out there, what the plan is. Um, as you do that, marking any hazards that might be in the area or different um kind of micro locations that would receive um, various levels of service. And um, also just putting a plug out here for kind of cameras or um, yeah, video cameras. I've even seen the use of game cameras um, up in St. Louis County, which is the county that Duluth is in. They have these barn owl cameras out and that allows them to see what's actually going on, um, what pavement conditions are across their county. They're the largest county in the state of Minnesota by geographic area. So the same um, 
kind of response to a storm doesn't necessarily make sense. One part of the county might have snow and the other part might not, right? Um, so this um, utilization of the technology that's out there allows people to make smart calls and not send people out if it's not needed. All right, we are moving right along here. I'm moving right along. Hopefully people are following along with me. I'm just double checking. I don't see any questions right now coming in, but if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, um, please type those into the chat or email me at wiseltwise at gmail.com. So just double checking that we're good. Okay. All right. So get to nerd out a little bit in this section. Um, I have a degree in chemistry, soil science. So um, you're going to see some chemical models. Um, bear with me. I'll, I'll make it fun. So looking at the, the various products that are out there and how they work. I would like, again, my preference is to talk in person with folks, but if you're able to in the chat or email me what materials you use to melt snow and ice, I would love to know that, to be able to reference those things. Um, so sometimes people talk about sand. Uh, I just wanna clarify that sand is not a de-icer. Um, sand is an abrasive. There are other abrasives that are used um, depending on where you are kind of in the state or in the country. Um, you're probably using just the cheapest abrasive in your area. Um, but these, they do help provide traction and that's definitely a, a great goal, right? Uh, as we work um, to the greater goal of keeping people safe, but they don't melt ice. So um, just clarifying that. And sometimes we see people mix, you know, salt and sand together. If you're doing that, you really want to have a goal of, okay, what are you doing? If you're aiming for traction with sand and you mix a little bit of salt in there so it doesn't, you know, clump up with moisture and freeze, you know, that makes sense. Um, if you're doing like a 50-50 mix of salt and sand, kind of say that's like, you know, going after a problem with the hammer and the screwdriver, like, doesn't really make sense. So um, if your your aim is to melt with salt, like then then do that, right? Otherwise you're melting and then your sand's kind of melting into the snow. So the de-icers we have out there, talk a little bit more about specifics um, in a little bit, but um, want to reinforce the idea that a given amount of de-icer will always melt a given amount of snow or ice. Um, Sometimes people kind of um, bristle at this because they feel like that's not true. Um, when it's cold, you have to use more. And uh, the issue there is not that more is needed to melt physically, but um, when temperatures drop, we see the rate of melting slows down. And so that kind of causes people to say, it's not melting, I need to add more. Um, and that's where we really wanna think about how much is needed at different temperatures and when do we wanna stop using salt because it's become pretty much ineffective. So jumping into to salt, um, the primary salt that we have out there on the market, um, when we're talking about rock salt, when we're looking at bag salt, when we're looking at you know even bag blends, if you look at the ingredients in almost all of them, the number one ingredient, usually 90 plus percent um, of the content of a bag product is going to be sodium chloride. And that's simply because it's the cheapest salt out there. So sodium chloride, NaCl, sorry, abbreviate that. Um, the Na and the Cl, the sodium and the chloride, they split apart when they interact with water. So my diagram on the right side are water molecules, H2O. I think a lot of us are familiar with that idea, H2O. Those molecules like to be by one another. They hang out, especially if they're frozen, they're bonded together. Um, and when they interact with the salt, they let go of one another and that's melting, right? We get those molecules to let go of one another and then they grab a hold of salt, the sodium or the chloride. 
And that's great because we, we've gotten things to melt, right? We want those um, mo water molecules to let go of one another, let go of the pavement um, and move so we can you know more easily remove it mechanically. But the problem is once they've let go and they've held on to that sodium or they've held on to that chloride, they don't let go. So that's why salt is a permanent pollutant in our water. Um, I did already kind of go over this point, but I think it's great to reinforce that pavement temperature is what determines that speed of melting. It, temperature is literally a measurement of how quickly or how much energy those little molecules have, how quickly particles are moving. So as temperature goes up, and do note I'm saying here pavement temperature or surface temperature, um, as that goes up, your melting speed goes up. So oftentimes um, people just, the general folks aren't really looking at pavement temperature or hearing or talking about pavement temperature. We think about air temperature, right? But um, air temperature is measured, you know, feet above the surface and where we want to be melting is the, is the surface itself. So we really want to dial in and make sure we understand what pavement temperature is when we're um, trying to move towards precision applications of salt. My little photo on the left here shows um, a sensor that was in, um, I should say, like a display for a road temp sensor in someone's cab of the truck. So sometimes you can get trucks with these mounted already, or you can purchase one. Sometimes people buy the little handheld um, devices as well. So just reinforcing as payment temperature goes up, melting speed goes up, payment temperature goes down, your melting speed will go down. Um, another concept to go over science idea here is that since the amount of salt determines the amount of melting power, um, more bigger crystals of salt will do more melting. Um, that doesn't mean though that they're always uh, the best option, right? Because we also not only care about, you know, how much power is there, but where that salt is. So I um, made a little diagram here and then think we can show oh, I got one more cursor move. There we go. That's what I want to show. Um, sometimes I see this where you've got, you know, a circle of what's melted in the snow and then the little grain of what's left of the salt in the middle of that. So sometimes bigger grains of salt. I've even heard seen sometimes people put down water softener salt. <laughs> Not a good choice um, because the salt isn't really where we need it to be. So in general, the smaller you can go with your grain size, as long as you can get that even distribution, you can cover more um, ground surface with equal or less material. So jumping now from sodium chloride to look at, you know, all the chlorides out there, um, I should say all of them, but the other two primary um, de-icers, uh, magnesium chloride and calcium chloride. So why, why look at these? Well, talked about this idea that sodium chloride um, slows down, isn't as effective at lower temps. And really it's about 15 degrees. Some people even say 20 degrees sodium chloride becomes relatively ineffective because it just is going to take hours for it to melt snow and ice. So when you have colder temps, you can then transition to use a blend um, or maybe blend into your brine. If you're using brine, say magnesium chloride or calcium chloride. These chlorides are kind of like the bigger, badder cousins of, of sodium chloride because they work at lower temps, but they also can do more damage. So um, that's something to consider. Um, and I would say the other thing to consider is the cost, right? Um, that was why we're using sodium chloride in the first place. And that's why we're going to continue to use it by and large because magnesium calcium chloride, they're naturally found um, in liquid form. And then they, you have to go through um, a lot of evaporation to kind of get them concentrated down. So all that additional kind of processing time and expense um, gets passed on, right? So they are sometimes like 20 times as much um, as what you're gonna pay for sodium chloride. Additionally, um, calcium chloride and magnesium chloride are more hygroscopic than sodium chloride is. Um, hygroscopic, kind of a big word, probably don't use it too much. Um, but the concept here is that um, it will take something that's hygroscopic, will take the water that's naturally present in the air, the humidity in the air, and it will absorb that into itself. So we can see these water molecules here moving into, um, you know, salt, 
more like rice. If you've ever, you know, gotten your phone wet and you put it in a bowl of rice, um, things that will draw moisture out. So um, sodium chloride can do that, right? It can pull in moisture and clump up, um, but magnesium chloride is better, more hygroscopic than sodium chloride and calcium chloride is the best. Um, that's great for, you know, use as a dust suppressant then. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but calcium chloride will actually be sprayed on gravel roads in the summer to bring moisture down to the road surface and prevent um, dust. But in the winter time, we don't really want to be pulling moisture down to the road surface, right? That could create a sticky, snotty mess. And um, that's why we only want to be using calcium chloride when it's real cool and there's not much humidity in the air. So I just have a couple pics here showing you a bunch of different de-icers that are out there, bag plot baked products um, that have lots of, you know, nice colors and names and, and claims. And I'm emphasizing the, use, the word use of the word claims because there is no truth in labeling um, with these products. So you really want to be a smart consumer and try to read what's actually in there. Sometimes they'll tell you percentages. Um, but like I said before, by and large, sodium chloride is going to be the number one ingredient and um, sometimes 90, 95 plus percent of it is still sodium chloride. So you can get that little kickstart from a little magnesium chloride or calcium chloride, um, but beware and don't trust that these things are gonna melt down to you know negative 50 degrees because calcium chloride, magnesium chloride don't even do that. Um, and yeah, just leave it at that for now. So there are um, non-chloride de-icers and um, we've talked about cost several times. Um, cost is the um, reason, the high cost of these, the reason why we don't see um, widespread use. Um, the one industry that does use quite a bit of non-chloride de-icers be the air, airline, airport industry. Our runways, if they were salted, our planes would be salted, they would be rusting out and we can't have that, right? So airports are willing to pay extra for these non-chloride de-icers. I've also um, heard of some um, DOTs using them. I think in Minnesota, MnDOT has been using some potassium acetate along Lake Superior, just trying to reduce the amount of chloride coming into that Great Lake. So these are less corrosive, price is high. And then it is not a typo. I said biodegradable, both an advantage and a disadvantage. So these non-chloride de-icers, if you, you know, want to geek out like me, you know, we don't see any chloride here, right? Um, in their formulas, they all have carbon though. So carbon means that something that can be eaten, broken down by living things by, can be degraded, broken down by biological organisms, um, living things. So I'm going to kind of show that process a little bit and get at why it's both good and potentially harmful. So non-chlorides, um, in a way we could think of them chemically as like sugars. They are not permanent pollutants because they're broken down. And that means they're broken down by something, something living. So if a living thing, a little microbe in the soil eats this, it then will also be breathing in oxygen and things that have plenty of food and oxygen, if their needs are being met, living things are, will reproduce and continue to eat and breathe and reproduce and eat and breathe and reproduce. And what's happening in our soils right now is we are breaking that material down. It's going into the bodies of those organisms, right? Eventually when they get eaten by something else or their bodies break down, we've um, degraded that product, but we'll also reduce the oxygen levels, which isn't a problem if our soil's in good health, as long as it's not really compacted, you can have oxygen um, cycle through there. Recycle. Um, in our water though, if we have a lot of non-chlorides moving into our water at once, um, we're gonna have the same process happening. So microbes eating and breathing and reproducing and eating and breathing and reproducing and eating and breathing and reproducing, and they are breaking down, biodegrading those non-chlorides, but they're also bringing down the oxygen levels. And if this happens, a lot of this happens at one time, oxygen levels can um, be depleted more quickly than they're regenerated. And um, that can be 
detrimental to organisms that live and breathe in that water. So um, non-chlorides include those acetates and formates we saw. And um, more and more, we're seeing people, I should say more and more, um, I think more and more, I think that's safe to say, um, utilize sugars, especially in, in pre-treated salts and in brine, additives in proprietary blends or blends people are making. So sugars do not melt ice, but they do some other cool things. Um, when we add sugars to our salts, they help that salt stick in place on the pavement surface. And um, I'm being told that someone else has this room. I'm giving a live webinar right now and was given this space. So I, um, yeah. So um, sorry about that. So um, sugars do help that material stick in place on the pavement surface and they reduce the amount of corrosion that's happening. Um, they prevent refreeze because they um, kind of get in the way when those water molecules are trying to find one another again and form a nice tight bond. Um, you can think about that like biting on a popsicle versus an ice cube and which one you know might break a tooth or a crown off. Um, but those non-sugars, they are delicious, or those sugars are delicious foods, right? So if a lot of them end up in our water at one time, um, we are feeding those microbes and we're going to be dropping oxygen levels. So just have um, here a list of some of those um, proprietary blends that are out there. There are a lot of them on the market. Um, so again, the use of the right material at the right time, um, if by the use of the sugar, you're able to drop, you know, your salt use, that's awesome, but don't think that there's something out there that has no impact. There is no silver bullet that we can put down and not worry about um, what it's doing environmentally. If you are looking at um, non-chloride de-icers, I would say you're going to get the best bang for your buck, you know, maybe around entryways or areas where you're seeing a lot of damage um, because then you're not only, you're kind of weighing the, out the cost of paying more for that de-icer, but um, not then paying to replace um, your infrastructure, that hardscaping, landscaping is frequently. Um, next topic here, rolling through is calibration. Really, really, really um, can't emphasize enough the importance of calibration. If you don't have your equipment calibrated, you really don't know what you're putting down. So that calibration needs to happen every year. And it's, yeah, the first step to really um, moving to precise application of materials. So this is a really cool picture used in pretty much every single presentation I give came um, from the city of Katahe, um a number of years ago now. And uh, they calibrated their trucks. Um, one of the trucks, you know, they thought they were, well, for all their trucks, they thought they were putting down 300 pounds a lane mile. And this particular one, you can see the pile um, to the left, was actually putting down 850 pounds per lane mile. So just by going through that calibration, um, dropping the salt use by, by two thirds, pretty much. So they were able to keep the dollars um, from those savings, the dollar savings in their department and reinvest them and get some better equipment. And within a couple of years, um, they dropped their salt use by well over 50%. Just last week, I actually got a follow-up email from Cudahy. They wanted to let me know, you know, they're still calibrating. And this was a new truck they'd gotten um, straight from, you know, the dealer. They said factory setting at 200 pounds a lane mile. They, what should have been 200 pounds uh, coming out, they calibrated it. And there was nine, there were 907 pounds over that 900, yeah, 907 pounds coming out. And that would have been coming out every lane mile, except they calibrated it and dial it back in so that when they're setting in the cabs at 200, it was actually putting out, well, they got pretty close, 205 pounds a lane mile. So just incredible, right? Um, you get a brand new piece of machinery, you need to calibrate it. We did a calibration clinic last week on Lake Geneva at their public works facility. It's part of the APWA fall conference. And, you know, once you get your system calibration dialed down, you know, we can do it in, I'd say 15, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes um, per truck. And all you need is a scale 
and a bucket, you know, or something a big garbage can. It could be five gallon buckets though to capture that salt in. We do have a fancier scale here that we borrowed from the county. On our website, we've got a whole bunch of calibration resources for, you know, manual trucks, um, trucks with forest controls, forest um, America controls, as well as, I think I got a photo here of a sidewalk that's not calibrated <laughs> to say, yeah, let's even calibrate that equipment we're taking out on the sidewalk. So this is a drop spreader. We got a little video about calibrating that. You also want to calibrate your liquid equipment too. So once you calibrate, um, that's when the fun begins and you can really um, start looking at application rates because you know what you're putting down. So this is a picture from the city of Stevens Point inside the cab of their truck. They made a little cheat sheet for drivers. On the top right, you can see here, um, they've got both air temp and road temp um, data available to drivers in the cab. So again, based on road temp, based on that surface temp, they are given a um, recommendation for rates per, um, per lane mile. So 120 pounds when they're 30 degrees or above, because salt isn't as effective as it cools, they are bumping those rates up. Um, oops, still under though, you know, 300 pounds of lima, which cut ahead, that's what they were aiming for before. Um, and then um, below 15 degrees, that's when they want to switch, not just use straight rock salt because it's not that effective, remember? And then they're, they're in this case mixing with geo melt, 20% blend. I will go back though here. I wanted to note this and forgot. Um, I don't know if anyone caught this. So Cudahy, you know, back a few years ago, they were aiming for 300 pounds a lane mile. And now this year, their standard they're going for is 200 pounds a lane mile. And in both cases, I think, well, I'm not sure with the 300, I think now with definitely with the 200, they'd be pre-wedding. So that's part of what um, enables municipalities to drop rates down even further. So going back here to kind of a, a guide um, for rates, I've made kind of a simple chart <laughs> um, for people somewhere between 200 to 300 pounds, um, you know, as your temperatures decrease, probably moving to that higher end of the range. The idea that as you move from rock salt to pre-wet salt, um, you can drop those salt um, rates down even more. Depending on your equipment, I'd say trying to get up to that higher end in terms of gallons per ton, but it really depends what your liquid capacity is on your truck. But in general, the more liquid, uh, the less rock salt is needed. And then below 15, not necessarily straight mag or calcium, but something that has some mag or calcium in it. And yeah, also noting here speed of melting. So moving to pre-wet salt is when we get the, the faster melting. Um, some more rate charts here, kind of breaking down um, pre-wet salt, also shake and bake. I think I've got a slide coming up showing this, but this is when you have direct liquid going down on top of granular material. So really getting a lot of liquid down. I do know there are different municipalities that have really bumped up liquids and are spraying those liquids on at, at really high rates. I'm getting more of an oatmeal kind of slurry, 40, 60, even 80 gallons a ton. So pre-treated versus pre-wet salt. Kind of share this idea that you know pre-wetting salt, um, bringing those those um, rock salt rates down, getting immediate results because you've already broken the sodium and the chloride apart, and they can just start melting immediately. Um, if you don't have the capacity to add liquid, um, you could still look at a pre-treated salt and use your same equipment, um, and then get a, a bit of a reduction from that. So liquids really seem to be the wave of the future here, or I'd say the, the future, the present. Um, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of adoption more and more. The DOT is definitely pushing liquids because they're just seeing that they work so much more efficiently. So live fast, die young, just like our rock stars. And that's what we want, fast action, right? So um, generally gets us to better pavement conditions faster. 
And again, the DOT um, in conjunction with Clear Road, which is a consortium of DOTs, has literally done the research to show that, that we get to better conditions faster with liquids. So I mentioned that sodium chloride of artery broken apart melting can begin right away. So pre-treatment, a few different ways to use liquids. Pre-treatment is putting down that liquid before the storm. So you'll see those lines down um, the road and it's like oiling your skillet. You prevent the bond from forming between the snow and the pavement. And that means less total salt is needed. You just get a better scrape. Um, Pre-wetting is mixing in liquid brine. So you've made your salt brine and you mix that or sp you're spraying that on the rock salt. So it sticks in place. You get less of that bounce and scatter effect um, with salt moving out of the lanes. We want to keep it on target where we need it to be melting. So get it to stay there. And then again, more immediate results is mixed with the brine. Direct liquid is the use of liquid salt. So salt brine before, during, and after the storm. So it's just using liquid. Um, this does require a lot of liquid. You got to have a good source or be making it your on your own and have the ability to make, um, potentially make a lot during the storm or have enough on hand um, and really kind of keep an eye on things because that live fast, it's great, but the die young part um, that liquids don't have the same kind of power because you do have less total salt there. Um, it's 23.3% uh, salt to water. I wanted to kind of make a diagram showing that, you know, how these liquids work and why they're so cool. You actually saw this before, this idea of, you know, okay, more salt seems great, right? But is it where we need it to be? So liquid is really just that idea we're spreading a little bit out over the whole surface. Technically, it usually goes down in lines, um, but you can still see that the benefit of that. So I'm gonna share just a few photos of different equipment that's out there that people have used. Um, for liquids and really kind of trying to show you the spectrum. Um, so the picture to the right here is a big anti-icing truck, the city of Green Bay mechanic working on that. I just love this <laughs> picture. We were there for a calibration clinic a couple of years ago. Um, picture on the left, Ho-Chunk Casino, really proud of the fact they dropped their cell use by 70% um, by using brine. And I don't know that that's fully just from the brine or the fact that they decided, yeah, we want to pay attention to this and educate our staff. And we're using brine as a part of that. Um, picture of Bayside right on Lake Michigan, caring a lot about um, their lakes and stream health. And they just got a probably a reused tote here in the back. And I don't really have a great picture of the spray bar on it, but I um, guess they like their new truck. It's been working well. Um, UW Whitewater, um, they gave a webinar uh, last month. So if you want to catch that, if you didn't, um, Joe Post talks about the use of brine there. They are making their own brine and um, applying that with equipment that, you know, they kind of made backyard engineering. You can see like the PVC pipe um, spray bar here. One of their pieces of equipment for spreading that. Um, in terms of making it, Again, I mean, you can go and buy you know, giant brine makers, mini brine makers. Um, this one to the left is a little gravity system um, made by um, staff Jake at uh, UW Eau Claire. So again, utilizing those totes, buying some hoses, you got somebody with that mechanical um, wherewithal and they can put these together. It's pretty impressive to me. That's not my skill set, um, but we can... I'm not sure if we have a webinar with um, UW Eau Claire, but we can definitely put you in touch with folks. And um, we also have equipment on houses. I'll mention those. And we had one in Eau Claire this fall so people can see and talk to the folks who are doing this and using it. So I've talked a lot about kind of municipal use, um, universities on the private side. Um, we're seeing more and more contractors utilize brine. So this is Bruce Company. I mentioned Jeremy Johnson earlier, the Madison area using brine on sidewalks and parking lots um, for various customers, dropping salt use by about 50% of those facilities. Um, kind of pivoting here, we've we got 15 more minutes um, into salt storage. So it really, the law is that you have to cover your salt. Um, if you've got a thousand pounds or more, it doesn't take too much to get there. Um, but even if you have less than a thousand pounds, please, please um, store your salt properly. Um, 
a roof or a tarp um, is considered, you know, tarp is considered okay. But in this case, you know, there probably was a tarp here, right? They were covering this with a tarp and, you know, some tires, but that blew off. And what's happening to our salt? It's just melting, and I should say melting dissolving with rainwater and moving across this parking lot, damaging all that concrete and eventually moving into our water. The salt is trash, right? Um, that's going to go probably to a landfill and then eventually into our water because we started treatment plants can't pull that out um, if once it comes to them from landfill leachate. And there are, you know, specific rules about, you know, being close to a private well or a municipal well, um, shorelines, but regardless of where you are, if the water um, interacts with that salt, it's moving into our groundwater, which is our drinking water, and it's moving into lakes and streams. Um, so I think wherever you are, <laughs> you need to take care of this resource. Um, so the snow itself, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about where to push that to have a plan. And then the communication piece. This is really, really huge. Um, thanks to all of you for coming and you know talking, listening to me talk, I guess, today. Um, but think about how do you communicate what you're doing and why you're doing with others. So these are some pictures from campuses and um, to the right, a county park, where they're trying to communicate expectations um, to people or explain why they're not gonna you know, shovel every inch of sidewalk or stairwell. And um, the signage there is great. I also say be proactive, utilize social media, utilize your website, e-newsletters, whatever you have, um, get those. We're getting ready for winter messages out. Um, this is what you can do, safe walking, proper footwear, parking regulations, whatever it is, um, whatever the pain points are for your agency or your community, communicate to people. Um, SaltWise, we've got some print resources that we'd be happy to share. Um, we're also on the socials and please you know, share like our stuff, um, put your own spin on it. So I think at this point, I've tried to cover this whole wheel of best practices um, within my, my hour. Um, utilize them, um, share your successes, what's working for you, what's not, happy to serve as a resource and connect you to other folks. So SaltWise really, really tries to do that across the state by bringing people together, having conversations around practices and policies and equipment. Our next equipment open house is actually tomorrow, Jefferson County. And then uh, I think we're going to pull one together for the next class that we have in Madison, which is November 28th. We have webinars like this one every month. So please keep signing up and sharing out our webinars. They're all archived on our YouTube channel. I um, want to put in a plug for municipalities and agencies that innovate and think outside the box. I know cost is a barrier. The city of Glendale said, yeah, we can't buy a, a new truck. We want to get on this brine train. Um, and then their fire department was selling a tanker truck and they said, yeah, we'll buy that for 30 grand and, and outfit it. So their mechanic, Ricky, um, turned this into their brine truck. And then the bottom right here is brine reclamation that's happening at the USDA Forest Products Lab. So we got a webinar sharing um, their stories. Liability is a real issue. And New Hampshire has targeted this through the Green Snow Pro program. And we decided to try to make this happen in Wisconsin. We got a bill introduced um, at the beginning of this session in January of 2023. And we're able to go to the Capitol and testify about the importance of this issue and that this uh, idea of a limited liability bill or law could really support smarter salting by protecting people who are educated and do proper snow removal and um, We've got it passed out of both committees. Uh, right now, we're struggling with some politics and egos um, in the, the Capitol building, believe it or not. But um, so hopeful that to move this ahead. So if you have any capacity to reach out to a legislator, I would encourage you to do that. You could email me for more information or see if there's a way that your organization could do that um, as well. 
So at this point, um, still under my hour here, wanna say um, thanks for joining. Um, please utilize our resources that are out there, the trainings, webinars, um, et cetera. We've got um, a lot of different things we've been communicating to and with other people wanna know how we can support you. And like I said before, follow us on social media. It's a small thing that you can do to help us get the word out and help us show that um, this work is making a difference and continue to bring in the grant dollars that we need to keep this program going. So um, here's my QR or a QR code for um, SaltWise resources. If you put your, your phone up to this on the camera mode, um, it'll bring you to a little link and you can um, utilize or get onto social media. I've got my email there and I'm really happy to take any questions if people have them at this time. So you can email me, I've got the email or drop something, drop a question, comment into the chat and I will respond to that. So I'm going to stop my share now so I can take a look at what might be coming up in the chat. Just kind of waiting here for questions to come in, or you can just say, you know, you're taking off too. <laughs> but I do appreciate, again, your time today. And um, thanks for your dedication to this issue. And feel free to reach out at any time. If you have other questions, thoughts, ideas, happy to be a resource. Give people another minute to drop some questions in. Check my Gmail as well. Okay. Not sure if there's a lag, but I don't see any questions coming in. So I think I'm going to sign off for now. And if you have any questions down the road, feel free to reach out via email. And with that, have, have a great day, everybody.